I was someone who did not respond well to criticism. Criticism would send me into this tailspin of I'm a failure. This is Elevate with Jack DeLosa. If you've ever suffered from anxiety or depression or even felt disconnected from self, this episode is for you. I sit down with one of my closest friends in the world, Sarah Hawley, who went from being an entrepreneur that seemingly had it all and had everything that society says is success, whereas deep down she felt depressed, she felt disconnected from self, she was feeling anxiety and deep sadness. We talk about Sarah's journey from that place to today being one of the most fulfilled and conscious entrepreneurs that I know, expanding her businesses here in the USA, and talk to her about what was the deep inner work that she did to get here, as well as talking about her business strategies for expanding throughout the US. This is a must see. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's so good to be here with you in Austin, Texas. Exactly. <laughs> You've paved the way for so many of us Aussie entrepreneurs that are looking to, to come over here and spread our wings. Yeah. How's that journey been for you? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I love it. I've been here since 2016, so going on six years, I suppose. Started in Colorado and found my way to Austin at the beginning of the uh, last, the pandemic the last couple of years. And um, it's amazing. Austin's such a great place. So, Sarah, you and I have been friends for a long time, mm-hmm. close friends for the last few years and, and, and continuing to get closer as we both continue on our own personal and spiritual journeys. As I reflect on the personal development and spiritual growth journeys I've seen people go on, yours needs to be one of the most transformational, profound, beautiful, courageous journeys that I think I've witnessed. Mm, Thank you. Can you talk to us about maybe a little bit about where you were and the work, the deep, Mm -hmm. gritty, messy, hard, (laughs) uncomfortable, courageous work that you've been doing for a long time now and continue to do Mm -hmm. to become the the, the conscious leader, the conscious entrepreneur, the the conscious mother, Mm -hmm. amazing human being that we have sitting here today? Yeah, I feel like it's a it's a big question. Um, it's like wrapping my mind around that journey is. It's hard to like put it into this yeah. succinct story, but yeah. I think if I like look back on my whole life, I feel like even as a child, I had a conscious awareness of the infinite of my immortality i would Mm. say i spent a lot of time in some aspect of existential crisis trying to understand things Mm. and i'm talking small child like five years old i remember Mm. places that i was having thoughts and i know that i lived in that city at that time or whatever so i can kind of trace the timeline and never really had anyone to talk to about it you know And, and it became it was very inside journey and a very inner a lot of my inner thoughts and I think I would try to talk to my mum about it and mm. I would ask her questions like, but what's on the other side of the universe? Like, where does it end kind of thing? And she would say, oh, just don't worry about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that sounds great, but I can't seem to not worry about it. Um, but I think, and and I just circle back to that. That's why I find this journey like interesting to pinpoint because I think what happened was as a teenager, I was – probably more similar to I how I'm living now. I was very free spirited. Mm. I was very intuitive. I was kind of bordering on having like psychic abilities of some description. But I was also living in a lot of pain and struggle because of my parents' divorce and, you know, I was partying and doing drugs and all sorts of things. Just really rebellious streak came alive in me and I was kind of bucking against any system, any authority, all of that. And then feeling a lot of rejection from the world around me as well because Mm. of this way that I was living where I was trying to find myself and trying to be safe in the world through my own independence and learning how to 
you know, take charge and take care. But when you're 15, 16 years old, that's like pretty chaotic. Mm. And um, as I kind of left my teens and entered my early 20s, I just decided that I wanted to be taken seriously in the world. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to you know, create a good life for myself and somehow probably formed a belief system that living in that way didn't go so well for me and that I really needed to immerse myself in the material world, so to speak, and just focus on that. The things that felt more, maybe like I felt like I could control them more or something mm. like that. And I really pushed a lot of that down and mm. just started pursuing my career and business. Obviously, that's how we met. Mm. Um, and the measures of success that we were sold at some point as being important money yeah. possessions that we would own fancy cars, nice houses, whatever it might be. Um, kind of really pursued that and pushed down my intuition, pushed down all of that side of myself and started living the way that I thought other people wanted me to live. So I would describe kind of my twenties and into my early thirties as really wearing a mask, like a pretty significant mask. And I, I was confident. I learned how to run companies and make money and manage that money. And I mean, I was in personal finance, actually. Um, learned how to speak on stage and be on TV and do all of the things that looked really successful. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, like that, I, it wasn't all bad. Like my life was pretty fun. And I was yeah. still, I still had that element of going against or at least questioning the status quo and kind of create, yeah. I knew my power as a creator, you know, that was, that was important and powerful, but I came to a point where no matter what I did, I couldn't fill or no matter what I achieved, I couldn't fill the void inside me. I couldn't fill those early questions that I had, like they mm. were not satisfied and mm. that hungry ghost just kept coming, I think. Mm. Um, and I would say the unraveling was when my dad passed away. So my dad mm. passed away when I was 20, uh, 32 and I was, I ended up getting married three months later, which I was not in, I'd obviously already said yes to the engagement, but at that moment I probably was not in the right space to make a commitment like that to somebody. Yeah. And rather than, you know, asking for a pause or de delaying things. I just wanted to keep going, just keep it all together, just keep going the way mm. that we're going. Mm. So we got married, we did the thing. And I think it just really started unraveling after that point where I just, it was like eating away at me on the inside that I just can't keep living this life that doesn't feel fulfilling to me, but I didn't know fully how to get out of it at that point. Mm. Um, moved to the US in 2016 and then ended up my marriage ended a year later and that was sort of the next part of the unraveling where things really started to become, I started to really explore and in a lot of ways things became unstuck because I just was letting go of all these past attachments. Um, and 2018, I had a full breakdown and just had to stop everything. It was just at that point where nothing could, I couldn't go anymore. I just couldn't keep got living this life that I had been living. And in terms of my business, I just said to my team, like, I'm out, like, do whatever you can do, just do your best. And I need a break. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I'm just, I'm done. And they were all really wonderful and supportive. And I took about a month. And in that month, I went on silent retreat. So I had a therapist what at the did time. What breakdown look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, like I said, it would be a long. This will be a long answer, <laughs> a, long, a long conversation. Um, so I had just, and and to give a little bit more context about some of the feelings I had, just a lot of anxiety I had had yeah. all of my life, um, yeah. certainly teen and into my twenties and up to this point. And so the anxiety was just building and building and building and ultimately led to depression the first time in my life that I'd felt like depression type symptoms for mm. longer periods of time and for no real reason not like obviously yeah. I felt really down when my dad passed away but like 
when there's a logical reason, I think it's it's a natural part of part of life. But I was feeling really, really depressed. And it was probably about a six month period. And no matter what I did, it just, I was probably just treading water. Like I was doing yoga every day. I was going to my therapist. I was journaling. I was meditating. I was doing, working out, eating well. I was taking periods off alcohol, like whatever the they tell you to do to try to beat the depression or whatever. Mm. I was doing it. And I literally felt like I was just treading water. Like I was just mm. barely able to stay afloat. And the actual breakdown and what it looked like was I flew back to Australia from for a, g- a girlfriend's hens weekend or bachelorette, as they'd say over here. Um, and we went, what did we do? Oh, we went out to a winery. That's right. And on the way out to the winery, we were in like a little bus with all of us. And I was just, everyone was laughing and having the best time and telling all their jokes. And I just had tears rolling down my face. And I was tucked in the back corner, mm. looking out the window, just being like, you can get through this. Like you can, you can be here. You'll be okay. But like, I did not feel okay. And I just had the tears rolling down my eyes. And I was at that point where I was like, I don't know how to be here I don't know how to connect with everyone like this is such a struggle and got to the winery and ordered the wine and all that and I was just like the alcohol will make you feel better like Mm. just whatever it takes just come on so drinking some wine and it just it didn't make me feel better you know it really I couldn't the the roar inside of me was so loud at this point that nothing was working anymore to numb it out or dull it out and I remember after we finished our lunch, I went outside and just sat under a tree with a blanket and I, and everybody was like taking their Instagram photos in the vineyards and looking all beautiful. And I was just like, I can't, I can't even do this. And we were going to go for a dinner and a party that night and everything. And on the way back from the winery in this little van, I was sitting tucked away in the corner again by myself everyone kind of knew that I wasn't feeling good at this point nobody really knew why Mm. they kind of left me alone and I just found myself lying there thinking I can't live anymore like I just I can't do this I don't know how to live I don't want to be here this is too hard like I'm just at that point and I guess I know the power of my mind I know the power of my thoughts And I know, you know, on the positive side of that, a spark of an idea, you know, you keep exploring it and it leads to magic. And I realized in that moment that that spark of that idea of I don't want to live anymore wasn't going to lead anywhere good if I didn't do something. Mm. And I was able to just, I guess, observe and see that. And we got back to the house and I just said, I'm out I can't go for dinner I can't go to this party I can't do anything and I was just crying and thankfully my girlfriend Danny Wales actually who it was her um, hens weekend she'd had her own experiences with depression and things in the past and just was like what do you need where are we going to get you and she got on the phone with my sister they booked me a flight I flew to Tasmania the next morning where my sister lives and spent a month with her Mm. but that even that night was one of the longest 12 hours of my Mm. life. They all went out to a party and I was just on the shower floor, just crying and just that same feeling. I just don't know how to live. I don't know how to be like, this is too hard to live with all of this inside of me that I don't have answers for. And I don't understand. And it feels like it's eating me. Like it was just, it was awful. Um, So yeah, that was what it looked like. Firstly, I didn't realize it had gotten that bad for you. Yeah. Uh, it's really powerful to hear that you were there for a time. Mm-hmm. Again, particularly knowing the, the person that you are today. Um, and thirdly, thank you for sharing that so easily and vulnerably and courageously. Mm, my pleasure. So you then went on a month long silent retreat. That's I went on I went to my sister's for a month. I went on a silent retreat just for four days in there. Good. I was thinking yeah. a month is a long time. <laughs> That's a to long be time. I I couldn't <laughs> even do four days. <laughs> a month is a very long time. So what were you met with there? So to give some context on that, I was terrified. 
yeah. to go on a silent retreat. Yeah. At this point in my life, one of my coping strategies to avoid the void yeah. was to surround myself with people. Right. You know, I would have told you I was an extrovert. I would have profiled as someone who was highly confident, very extroverted, very energized by high activity, lots and lots of people. Not true now that I know myself, but that's how I was at the time. That was a huge coping strategy for me. I did not ever want to be alone with myself and with all of those thoughts. That's amazing. So so you thought you were an extrovert and you're not. Yeah, definitely not. Interesting. <laughs> definitely not. I am really quite introverted and need a lot of time yeah. to recharge Same. on my own. I enjoy and definitely do get energy and alive live and alive um, from being around other people. But, you know, now that I really understand my own energy, I understand how it works and I understand how to recharge. And I'm also not afraid of my own time, which I was at that point. I remember my sister dropping me off at the silent retreat and I was a mess. I was literally terrified. So it was the fear of being alone With that my was thoughts. driving the extrovert. I was like, what is this going to be like? And it's hard for me to even sit here today and remember that space that I was in right that I would be so terrified to just sit with myself right but I was today it comes so it's what you do it's, yeah. <laughs> you I've are. spent plenty of time I mean I have a one-year-old baby I'm like oh yeah and, I just and, have and, some and time a startup that you're raising millions yeah. of dollars for and everything else but but you're very good at sitting in your own presence yes but at the time I was just terrified of what that experience was going to be like of how I would escape it, really. Yeah. Like, how am I going to escape my thoughts when there is no escape, when I just yes. have to sit there with them? Yes. And my sister was looking at me like, you are so weird. Like, you do not have to be here. Why? You are crying. You're scared. Also, the accommodation sucks. She was like, this place is gross. What are you doing? <laughs> On the point around trepidation, I'm not sure if you remember, but... I used to, uh, when I lived in Sydney, I'd go to the Blue Mountains quarterly for mm -hmm. three or four days. I'd go by myself. Mm -hmm. The phone would be off. I wouldn't take the laptop. It was literally me. I, I'd stay in a hut that had no electricity. So it was oh, me, crazy. a fireplace, and a three-hour walk, and that was it. And, I, and it, I, I've often said that it was the most productive three or four days in my calendar, which sounds like a counterintuitive word because I wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. But I could be carrying challenges for weeks, months, even in the beginning when I started doing, carrying challenges for years. Mm -hmm. Literally within half an hour of being there, I would have found resolution around whatever challenges it might have been. You know, just be journaling or looking at the mm -hmm. fireplace. But I remember the first time <clears throat> I went there, I'd, I, you know, I would have been 23 at the time, 24 maybe. I just lost my license, so I was getting a bus out to the Blue Mountains. <laughs> and I remember when I, as I was packing my bag, and at this point, I think you might have even been with it. We, you know, we were going skydiving. We were doing like whitewater, right? Like I was doing all this adrenaline stuff, starting businesses, doing all this stuff that seemed really brave and courageous. And here I am packing my bags to go away for three days by myself, and I was scared stiff. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, like, because, you know, you and I, are, uh, we're highly self-aware and self-attuned. I remember as I was packing, I, I thought to myself, Joe, well, Jack, what are you scared of? Mm -hmm. And the answer was I was scared of having no distraction to distract me from myself. Yeah. And that was particularly in the context of everything else I was doing that I was doing relatively easy. That was really frightening. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine... Four days, complete silence, yeah. particularly in the state that you were in. Coming in in the lowest state I've ever been in in my life. Yeah, it was just, it was scary, but it was beautiful. I mean, one of the most relieving experiences that I had early on in that retreat was I don't have to be anything for anyone mm. in this moment. I don't even need to smile at the person I'm walking by in the hallway. I don't need to pass anyone the salt I don't need to do anything for anyone they were very explicit about that at the, when they kind of did the intro is like you are here for you you don't communicate with other people in any way there's no like nudging and pass a thing or head nods as you walk by there's none of that and it was incredibly relieving and it mm. created a lot of space for me I had a lot of grief come up I think from that of just realizing how much of my life is all about showing up for other people and mm. how I should be and, and all of that. But yeah, it was, a yeah. Proving myself yeah. being enough, um, being someone that everybody would like and yeah. not 
abandon. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's my core wound. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that, that retreat was, I mean, it was very hard. I, I cried a lot. I slept a lot. It wasn't, it, I'm sure if I went on silent re- retreat now, it would be wonderfully expansive yeah. experience. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I was just, but it was a step and it was a step yeah, that really a took step. me to what was next. And it was crazy because I was on the phone to my therapist and she suggested it. And that right after I got off the phone to her, I was thinking, oh, where am I going to find a silent retreat in Hobart, Tasmania? Went and picked my sister up. She'd been having a coffee with a friend. And as I was walking out the door, I saw this beautiful square card match printed with a butterfly on it. And I picked it up because it was just pretty. Wow. And it said Metaf- metamorphosis retreat. And it was in one week in Hobart. Wow. And I was like, okay, I'm and definitely the going. universe going, we're going to support <laughs> yeah. you in this direction. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so you do the four days. It's, I imagine there would have been a lot of processing, as you say, a lot of crying, a lot of reflecting. Mm-hmm. Um, where does your journey take you after that, your healing journey? So it was it was a step out, but unfortunately, you know, it was still a long road from there. So yeah. I, I kind of was doing better than I had before, but it wasn't like, okay, I hit my rock bottom, I went on retreat and now I'm healed. Mm. It was it was really just the beginning of climbing out of that hole that I'd gotten myself into. Um, I think there was a lot of power in just stopping everything and yeah. saying, that's it. I was living in Vancouver at the time. That was not serving me and I really desired to move back to Colorado. Another completely serendipitous thing was one of the exercises I did that I just came up with myself was like, I knew I didn't want to be in Vancouver. So I was writing, where do you want to be? And where have you ever loved being? And I wrote three houses down. One was my sister's house. I wasn't going to live there forever. Another was a house that I'd lived in in the past. And the third was my auntie's house in Colorado. And she called me two days later, noticing I hadn't been on social media. Are you okay? What's going on? And I was chatting with her and I told her about this exercise that I was doing. And she said, well, that house is up for rent. The tenants move out next week. You can take wow. it. And I was like, what? Wow. So I took that house and I moved in on the 1st of December um, that year. I, I'd had the breakdown in the kind of end of October. So that house just came and that was an incredibly healing place for me and a place that I could call my own. And I was calling my power back by going back to the place that I wanted to be. <clears throat> excuse me, from Vancouver, returning back to Colorado. Um, but to fast forward a little bit. So the journey was, you know, I was on the way up, but it really was a struggle. And another serendipitous thing happened around May the following year. So 2019, <clears throat> I was still just feeling struggling. I was still going into really dark holes at times. And I, I had this one day where just couldn't barely get out of bed. I had my, I'm a member of EO. I had my EO forum that afternoon. And the only thing I needed to do that day was go to the grocery store and get some food for the meeting. And mm. I drove to the grocery store. I sat in my car for an hour crying, mm. just trying to build up the strength to go into the store and buy some freaking chips and dip or whatever I was yeah. trying to do. So, you know, just to give you some perspective, I was still in a really rocky territory yeah. and I was still dropping into those dark places regularly and feeling increasingly frustrated by like, what do I do and how do I do it? And I happened to get an email um, about Soltara Healing Center in Costa Rica, which is an ayahuasca retreat center. And I just clicked the link got my credit card, booked the retreat. It all just happened and I was going three weeks later. And I remember saying to my EO forum that day, like this is my last ditch effort, like at this point. And when I say last ditch, what I mean is before going on some kind of antidepressants because I intuitively felt very against doing that. I felt very strongly my whole life that that was not a path forward and Mm. it was only another way to escape and mask what Mm. was really going on. But I had gotten to the point by this stage that I was like, I don't even know, maybe I have to, maybe there is no other way out. You know, that, that for me, that was like high level of desperation because Mm. it was not in alignment with me in any way, shape or form. Mm. So ayahuasca felt like this last ditch attempt to try to figure this out because everything I was doing wasn't really moving the needle that much. And for me, very grateful. It was incredibly transformative Mm. and really was, the thing that that 
changed everything. I've never wow. been the same since that first ayahuasca retreat. And wow. it was a remarkable difference for me after that. Um, I've never experienced anxiety since. And I go into my underworld, but I think it's more of that's how I see it now of like, okay, I'm, I'm in something. I'm figuring through something. I don't label it as depression. I don't feel like I suffer depression anymore. What was it about the ayahuasca journey that was so transformative for you? So I had two ceremonies where not a lot happened uh-huh. and got mid the first two. Yeah. The first two got midway through the week and just was like, Oh, is this even going to do anything? Still mm-hmm. feeling hopeless. Like, okay, I came to ayahuasca and even that's not going to do anything. And just to clarify, so you're on the journey, you mean you didn't feel anything or, or you, you, I didn't feel a lot. No. Right. I so felt there were mild journeys. Really mild. Yeah. Like I felt the way that you feel when you're falling asleep on the couch, watching a movie sure. where you're kind of like in and out. But and maybe you're in a bit of a dream space, but like not fully out. So I kind of felt yeah. a little like that, but it it was nothing profound. Yeah. Um. My third ceremony. So a, a midweek, I'd gotten to the point where I was like starting to feel really desperate because mm. I had felt intuitively to go, and I was like, wow, I don't even know what I'm going to do if I leave here, and mm. I'm still feeling the same. Mm. And I had a really wonderful conversation with a gentleman that was there talking about intentions and things like that. And he just said some sage advice that helped me. And he said, just keep it really simple with your intention. Mm. And that made sense because I'd been going up to the altar to drink and saying, please help me fix all these different things that have broken <laughs> in my life. And like, I brought my list. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't even wrap my words around it because I was like, everything is broken. Like, I don't even know where to start. Fix everything. <laughs> And so I sat with it that day and I got clear on what my challenge felt to be was that I could not stop ruminating on the past. You know, I couldn't stop ruminating on things that I had done to others, things that had been done to me, how it had all been experienced, how much pain, there was just so much pain that I felt either I had caused or had been caused to me. Obviously, I would reframe that now, but that's how I was feeling on that Mm. day. And so my intention was show me the path to forgiveness Mm. and that was it. And it felt so clean and clear and simple. It's like, that's what I need. And I had the most beautiful ceremony where I just showed me that everything has a true nature. And when we are not in our true nature, things don't go very well, but, our, our nature is our nature. There's nothing to forgive. It just is. A tree is a tree. It's planted. It don't, doesn't fly. You know, a bird needs to fly. She showed me all these nature analogies and showed me as a bird, like if I try to be planted, it's not necessarily in my nature and I need to be free. And she just showed me these beautiful nature analogies. It was so simple. I was overjoyed. I was giggling I was just it was light it was like oh there is nothing to forgive like this is just it's so simple and I've always felt free of that and with a deeper understanding of our true nature and and alignment really ever since show me the path to forgiveness of self and others I think wrapped up in it yes for sure but I just I just was, it really just meant forgiveness. It meant just letting go. And, and, the, and the nature metaphors that you were showing throughout the journey, for you, the, the lesson there was that everything's happening organically and as it should and it's all perfect, therefore there's nothing to forgive. Yes, and that where things weren't happening perfectly were when we were acting outside of our true nature, trying to be something that we're not. Yes. And... Um, the tree and the bird analogy were interesting at the time because I had been in a relationship with someone who was a lot more rooted and I was a lot more flighty, so to speak. And yeah. the relationship was very chaotic for us and caused yeah. a lot of pain. And sh- that was just one of the examples of the that she was showing me that this is not he is not wrong and you are not wrong. Mm. It's just always going to be hard for the bird to live permanently in the tree That's kind true. of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But she showed me other beautiful analogies with my dad, with my career, yeah. um, just with so many 
things, but through this beautiful nature landscape, it was such an incredible journey. And I just yeah. understood from that moment that whenever we're trying to be something we're not, it's not going to be in flow. It's not going to be expansive. It's not going to be calm mm. when we're trying to be something we're not chaos and destruction, you know, ensue because we're pulling away from our true nature. And the opposite of that is also true, isn't it? Which is when we're living in our true nature, the entire universe conspires and providence exactly. moves too <laughs> yes. uh, in service of whatever we're in service of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so beautiful. What do you think, for those that are, are yet to go on an ayahuasca journey, and I might share one of my stories in a moment as well, because I had a lot of symbolism in one of my journeys and it, it showed me a perspective that I had never had before. But for those who haven't been on an ayahuasca journey, what do you think it was about th that journey? And what do you think it is about this kind of medicine mm -hmm. that enables the transformation to happen at such a fundamental level? <sighs> ayahuasca is – there is a sentience there. There is a consciousness that – you're interrelating with that mm. I think is very hard to grasp until you've experienced it. There's something deeply magical that's yeah. happening. Um, and I in particular asked for a gentle growth at that time in my life. I mm. also saw my pattern of making things hard so that I'd earn them. Mm. And I got exactly that. I got a beautiful, gentle journey but trusting that ayahuasca or any of these medicines will give you what you need and trusting yourself that you'll be ready for that, whatever it might be. Um, I think they're so profound and healing because we are connecting with the infinite and we're able to more deeply see and understand the oneness, the, the fact that we are consciousness experiencing itself, I mm. guess God experiencing itself, it, it's, it's hard to Language. read this stuff yeah. and it's the gnosis or the embodiment of something. To, to really know something versus to know it intellectually, yes. I don't know. For me, that's what I feel it is, is these medicines yeah. help me access and understand something in a really embodied way where I know it. Yeah. I don't just understand it yeah. and resonate with it. I actually know it. Mm. I saw it. I felt it. I lived it. And I've explored the idea of all of these medicines, but they are, if they give you access to something and you, you have an experience there, mm. you now have that as a memory. Mm. So now that's a known reality. Mm. Mm. That, yeah, it's an implanted so deeply in you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, the symbolism was was that you were sharing was super interesting. As I said, in, in, in one of my journeys, so I had broken up with my previous partner, let's say 12 months prior, but we had continued to kind of be very close and continued to see each other for probably nine, ten months after that. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing a journey shortly after that. And... Um, what the medicine showed me through one journey in particular was it was a globe, but it had squares missing. Mm -hmm. So it kind of looked like one of those, I don't know if it's Greek mythology, but you, you could see a globe and there's squares missing in it. It's like a piece of art almost. Mm -hmm. And it showed me that and what it was representing to me. And, and again, it's not an interpretation. You don't see it and then you think, how am I interpreting that? It's like... You just kind of it, know it. It's in inherent the <laughs> yeah. in the thing that you're being shown, right? And what what it was demonstrating to me was, Jack, this is your perspective and you're missing almost half of your perspective. The gaps were the feminine perspective mm. that I wasn't seeing. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to review our entire relationship, the entire breakdown of the relationship and the entire period after the relationship from Tiff's perspective mm, that's beautiful. completely. And 
I, I even remember sort of consciously thinking at the time, this is amazing. I, I'm literally reliving our relationship from the perspective of the feminine. And so I was able to see how some of the behaviors and the patterns that I was engaging in were making her feel. And, you know, because when there's a degradation of relationship, it's something that's common for a, a male to do, particularly in my instance, is you withdraw a little bit. You, you withdraw a little bit of love. And it might mm -hmm. only be subtle. But what that does in the feminine is it causes unsafety, which gives rise to more of the behaviors that you might have had a challenge with at the beginning and you go on this sort of mm -hmm. downward spiral. It exacerbates the distance. And so I was able to see how my subtle withdrawings felt for her mm -hmm. and how her responses were completely um, understandable is the wrong word, but like she was responding how she knew because she was beginning to lack the safety that she once had. And it's amazing. It's amazing how you can – because I – Certainly consciously, that's not a perspective that I had carried previously. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe somewhere in, you know, coming off the back of 4,000 ancestors, maybe it's in there somewhere and I was unlocking it. Maybe it's a metaphysical thing. Who knows where it comes from? But I was granted an entirely different perspective, that's an amazing. entire relationship that I had never glimpsed before. And now you have more insight into... The like feminine. It, you pro and also to yourself. Like you probably yes. didn't... You weren't consciously withdrawing. It's right. like such an innate behavior right. that we don't even realize we're doing so not only were you granted her perspective you i would imagine have a deeper perspective of that feeling in yourself when you might feel like oh i'm gonna withdraw wait no i'm not because that's 100 <laughs> you know? percent. that's actually and i actually haven't joined these dots before but that was a large reason why i started to do the inner child work mm -hmm. because what i needed to learn was how do i you know i'll, I'll give you an example um, if if Tiff was doing something and we agreed I was going to do something, Tiff was going to do something, and then she got to a point where it was too hard, I would either come in and do it for her and rescue her, or I would condemn the behaviour mm -hmm. and 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 take a superior position, mm -hmm. you know, and become critical. Mm -hmm. And what I and I knew neither of those were the right response. And so what I needed to learn was how to in those instances, offer the emotional support that she needed in that moment and support her however that looked, if that meant coming in and doing it for her, okay, or if that meant giving her time or if that meant just enabling her to feel heard mm -hmm. and have a conversation and al allowing her to express and pause or whatever it might have been so that she can then undertake the task that uh, she, she wanted to undertake. And so I needed to learn how to be more in tune emotionally but also respond by holding the right space mm -hmm. and not react by coming in and doing it or running. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you're right. It, 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 it catalyzed a whole – it highlighted a deficit that I had had mm -hmm. that I needed to address which sent me on the inner child work. It's powerful work. Yeah, it's the <laughs> most powerful work, right? Yeah, it's really powerful. So one of the things I want to come back to in, in this conversation is the thing, the rituals that you do today. But I might just pause that for now because mm -hmm. where I want to go prior to that is another thing that's super unique about you is you're somebody that has – gone on the the journey from where you are to where you are now and all the work that that has uh, involved and you're somebody that completely infuses it into your business world mm -hmm. and into your businesses which is not easy because <laughs> often we're talking about two different energetics mm -hmm. a lot of the time you wrote a book called Conscious Leadership. You're an incredible example of conscious leadership. And as, as I said, it's, it's a difficult line to walk a lot of the time. Can you talk to us? Let's just start broadly. What what does conscious leadership look like for you? And, and how do you employ conscious leadership in your businesses and with your team? Mm. It's It's really been bringing all of this inner work into my business and my team and yeah. there's been a trust there that that's 
the right thing to do or that that is going to work for lack of better words. But mm. so it's, it was definitely a leap of faith. faith. Mm. Um, however, it's been very, very transformative. Um, and where that leads me to today, like what, how I would describe conscious leadership is, is really being – being the most, <laughs> oftentimes the most vulnerable, um, but being vulnerable with my team in that I will share with them what is real for me in any moment. It means doing the same deep work that we would do in our loverships, these patterns of avoidance and withdrawal, but doing them with my team. Yeah. Um, and 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 bringing that awareness in of myself to the team, trusting that I'm them and also creating a space for them to do that as well. It mm. means empowering my team to also come to me when I might have a blind spot and, and for me to stay open to that. But a lot of it really comes down to these very open, transparent conversations, um, knowing when I'm triggered and removing myself and then coming back and closing the loop on the conversation. Um, it's approaching us as a team, as a group of people of equal value and worth coming together to create whatever it is that we create in the world and not seeing myself as the boss and someone who has to have it all together. So when I think about leadership, I think of, well, my job is to kind of understand and hold the vision of this company and where we're taking it and then kind of strategically get it there. And then it's really connecting the dots for everyone in the team connecting them to that, keeping them connected to that vision and that strategy. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I see the role of the leader is, but it's not like I'm better than everybody else. I'm above everybody else. I have to make all the decisions. What I say goes, if you don't like how it is, then leave mm -hmm. or whatever. A lot of my job is navigating, um, keeping us true to our values and navigating difficult conversations when either myself or someone in the team slips off to the side of one of the values so that we can pull it back in and stay aligned. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a beautiful journey and there's a lot of continuing to lean into it. Yeah. Seeing where I'm still not yet fully doing it. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of shows up as well. Yeah. Because the stories of hierarchy and, um, the boss and it's so deeply ingrained these yeah. business structures that we've been operating in for so long that the idea of being the CEO of the company and crying in your leadership team meeting because you're feeling really stuck and mm. really hopeless and you don't know how to move forward mm. or being completely triggered into some past trauma by something that somebody said mm. and voicing that and saying, yeah, I can really feel this part of me activated. I need to take a break and let's loop back on it and then looping back and saying, when you said that, you reminded me of X thing that happened in my childhood mm. and that's why I was so activated. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but having all of those conversations are really transformative and, and kind of moving for everybody involved. We've spoken at length about this and uh, another way, I mean, what I love about you is you you employ who you are and, and, and your values in every situation all of the time. Now, nobody does it perfectly, mm -hmm. but, but you're really consistent. And we're talking about, you know, you're going through a capital raising process and you're deselecting investors on the basis of a lack of energetic and, mm -hmm. and values alignment. And I said to you, because, you know, obviously this is a conversation and an endeavor that I'm often thinking through and wrestling with and mm -hmm. implementing in my own ways. I said to you, do you ever worry about how much downside it's causing? And you looked at me and you said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just loved it because as you're talking, you know, you, say, you break down in tears in a leadership meeting. Those listening to, to this or watching this show might think, oh, my God, what, what, what will my team think of me? Mm -hmm. And will they still respect me? Yeah, and I still think those things. <laughs> exactly. That's where I was going yeah. is, is all the human stuff that we would uh, – all the fear that would deter us from behaving the same way in this situation – you have all those same concerns. You're just showing up anyway. Yeah, there's an innate trust that this is mm. for the highest. But it gets rocky sometimes, let me tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I definitely sometimes think like, why are you doing all of this hard work? Like, why don't you just go in, tell them all what to do and get on with it. <laughs> but that's not, I know, I know, I know that's not going to serve the highest. How did you foster such a deep degree of trust <sighs> to that truth? Little by little. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I mentioned that intuition and everything I had as a teen and then pushing it down for so many years when I had that awareness that that's what I'd been doing and that I had, I had no idea how to trust myself. That's kind of where I landed. Like, I don't even know what I want, what I need, what I feel. And then realizing I needed to come back to center, to understand self and to start trusting my heart, trusting that knowing, trusting that voice. Um, it was little by little mm. because I had cultivated a relationship of distrust with it for so long. Mm. And, and now it's just all the evidence. And I, I was going to say, I, I still feel vulnerable, but with my team, for example, these stories we're talking about when something like that happens and I still think, oh, did I go too far? Like, yeah. you know, am I, am I too far down the path? Like, is it too much? Um, but what comes to me is like I'm more confident in my vulnerability than I was. So it's mm. still vulnerable. Mm. It's still – I still have the questions, but I have now years of evidence that mm. every time I showed up that way, it was actually transformative and expansive and I can still pinpoint – and I'll hear my team talking about moments two years where I did or I showed up in a way that has had a ripple effect out, a positive ripple mm. effect out for years to come. So it is that little by little and building that evidence that this is actually moving in a really beautiful direction. Confident in your vulnerability. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so for those watching and listening to this, the little by little, what is um, an example of a little by little step that one can take? Is it when, when you feel that thing that tells you not to do it, don't do it. When you feel that thing tells you to do something, do it. Like, How does someone start to practice? Mm. It's. I think it's finding the thing that you want to practice mm. and then practicing. So I'll give a really practical example that I think is really important. Um, we all get triggered. Our nervous system gets activated and our mind tells us we're justified. So we have these stories of why we're very angry, very disappointed, very whatever at somebody none of those stories are real. Your mm. system's been activated most likely because of a past trauma, something that's happened somewhere along the line that you've formed a belief system on. And now this person is just showing up in a way that is further, you know, cementing that story. Yeah. So if you can get familiar and I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners understand what I'm talking about. Mm. And, and even for those who don't, Getting familiar with when your system gets activated and heightened, when you're mm. feeling those really impassioned emotions, to just understand that that is, there might be something deeper there to think about than the situation that's right in front of you. Mm. So a simple practice within your team is the next time you feel that in a meeting where you start to feel yourself get really over-energized about whatever is in front of you, just take a break. Don't respond that time. Just don't respond. Just let the person do the thing that's making your system be activated mm. and just tell yourself I can come back to it later and get off the call or the meeting or whatever and just contemplate what happened. When have I felt like this in the past? What is this pattern in me? Like, why do I always feel angry when X happens? Why do I yeah. always feel frustrated when X happens? Yeah. And once you get a sense of it, maybe ask that person if they can hold some space for you to explain what comes up for you mm. and why. Mm. And in and doing that, not telling them what they've done wrong, but speaking from your own mm. experience, mm. just try it. Mm. You know, just try it once and see how it happens. Mm. And I still get triggered and I still don't know I'm triggered and I still fly off the handle sometimes and then mm. I come back. But mm. So it is a practice. Mm. But just starting with one thing. Mm. And if you have that one person that always, you know, if you're listening and you're thinking of that one person <laughs> that always gets under your grill, you know like choose that. Yeah, choose that person because you know it's going to come up again. Yeah. And next time it comes up, just take a pause and act differently and just see what happens. 
And a really good distinction there, often people ask, you know, I'm observing this behavior in somebody else. Is it their stuff or is it my stuff? And the answer is the behavior is theirs to own. The behavior is theirs. But if you have a triggered response... That's how you know you've got stuff. Yes, there. you won't be feeling all those things if it's <laughs> right. not partly your stuff. Right. And so if if when you resolve whatever stuff it is that's causing that trigger to come up, you'll be able to observe the behavior and you'll be able to witness the behavior without being triggered by it. So the behavior belongs to them. The trigger response belongs to us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's a really powerful place to start. And this is where we get to explore boundaries what are our personal boundaries Mm. i have a really great example of this actually in a leadership team meeting last year um i was working on something and i was having a bit of trouble with it and my cto who is an older male kind of confronted me in front of the team of like what's going on like are you going to get this thing done or not and then he threw out some question like do you even really want to be doing this and i was so triggered I was really, I was like, I was shaking. I couldn't barely string two words together. Like I felt so hurt, so unseen, so furious. I felt all the things at once. Mm. And so much so that I I had to say, guys, I'm going to, we're going to have to just wrap the meeting because I'm not going to be able to be productive right now. I'm really, really triggered. I'm in a really heightened state. Um, So I think it's best we just finish up. We tick the dots on the things we needed and we wrapped the meeting. Yeah. And I went away and I, I messaged him afterwards. I mean, everyone knew I was triggered because of that. That was yeah. that was obvious. That was in the open. Um, mm-hmm. And I messaged him afterwards saying, I'd like to circle back with you on the conversation tomorrow at 10 or whatever. We scheduled a time. I need to process what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And I went away and I sat with it and I sat with, well, I have past trauma of early in my career, older men kind of, not seeing me I was always trying to prove myself and I was never enough and that was a lot of what was coming up Mm. I was someone who did not respond well to criticism responded really well to positive feedback criticism would send me into this tailspin of I'm a failure and that was what was coming up for me further I felt it was unacceptable for him to ask me in front of the whole team if I wanted to do the, if I even wanted to do this. Yeah. So then when we came and had the conversation, I was like, this is my trigger. This is the things that I'm working on. Um, I'm really glad that you called me out on how long it's taking me to get this thing done because there's some blocks here and I need to get it done. And that was all really valid and really important. And the way that you communicated X is not okay, not okay in this organization. Yes. And he was like, I agree. Yeah. Thank you for sharing everything with you. And, you know, he then reflects on how he sometimes gets to that kind of frustrated state and he like just spits things out or whatever. So there was beautiful growth for both of us. Yeah. And it was a chance for us to navigate and talk about what is the company we're building and what is the behaviors we want to foster. And no, we're not going to be perfect, Mm. but we at least want to pull ourselves back in line when we need to. That's a really beautiful example because it's multidimensional. It's a really good example of there are things here that are triggering me that I need to reflect on and process and work through. And there is also a behavior there that is not okay and is not constructive, particularly in front of the rest of the team. And so there needs to be a boundary in place there. Mm-hmm. So it's a good example of where, where you've come at it and it's been both. There's, there's been your stuff and a behavior that, that, that needs a boundary around it. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, just because I can't help myself, it's going to feel like a right turn, but grow remotely. <laughs> yeah. It's just. So I, I love talking about my company. <laughs> good, we, can, good. we can take that turn. We, <laughs> we, were, we were, were we doing lunch or something in uh, Sedona recently and with um, Joe and Luca, your husband and your beautiful son. And so uh, cute. they ended up leaving the table because Sarah and I were so <laughs> engrossed. I'm talking about business. In this business <laughs> conversation. Now, I see, as, as do you, I see inside of tens of thousands of businesses a year, and it's rare and unique that I get as, as excited as I did uh, that day over that table with you. <laughs> it's so <laughs> hence, exciting. That's why I can't not discuss it in this chat. So, uh, Gromo, it's, it's, it's a new company you've started. It's an absolute game changer it really solves a core fundamental problem for business owners that i know is prevalent inside of 
every business mm-hmm. and, and, and you're doing it in a really efficient, effective, streamlined way. Talk to us about what, what the business is and, and where it's going. Mm-hmm. Well, Gramoli is a remote work marketplace that allows companies anywhere in the world to hire people anywhere in the world. That's kind of the simplest distillation of what we do. But really, we have overlaid that or perhaps a better term is the foundation of our business and what we stand for is culture first. So understanding that all of this work that I've done over the years and everything that I brought into my companies and how transformative it was, I want to bring that to the world so that people and companies can come together and work in a way that is a group of empowered sovereign individuals creating something amazing together, much more expansive. Um, And there's a whole world of talent out there now through remote work that we can access. So that's kind of the the quick pitch, but um, I'd love to yeah dive deeper into yeah what we're doing and how we're doing it. Absolutely, and it, it it it's fundamentally changing how people can find remote professionals, whether they be junior and senior, mm-hmm. right? So if someone wants a CFO or a CMO or a whoever, oh, uh, you can find them through Growmotely. Yeah, and you're doing so much more than just helping people find applicants. You're also enabling a recruitment process mm-hmm. that is effective, which is something that every business owner, until until they get coaching or training or advice around it, really struggles with yes. recruiting effectively. And so talk to us about um, how just the kind of user interface and the journey that you take can, that candidates have to go through in order to apply for roles aids the recruitment process for the employer. Yeah, I think that's um, a really good point. And just for everybody listening, I'm sure it's mostly business owners. I mean, most business owners complain about their teams to some degree or another. And this is ultimately the problem I want to solve. Like it doesn't have to be that way. One of the things that makes me shake my head the most is when people say, oh, the thing I hate most about business is the people. Yes. I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) Like maybe don't be in business then. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Firstly, yeah, there's, there's there's a bit that needs to be unpacked there. And recruitment is, a. here's the thing. Every business is a recruitment business. Mm-hmm. If, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this right now, your company is a recruitment company and that's all your company is, is it's a recruitment company. How well can you get a bunch of people moving in the one direction? Yep. And the more engaged and happy those people are, that's a lot easier for you every single day of your yes. life. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so we have built um, – on the company side of, of Grow Motley, because obviously we have the professionals and the companies, on the company side, we've built an end-to-end HR tech, SaaS solution, basically, to run yes. your entire HR. Yes. And I, our target market is smaller smaller to medium growing businesses. The businesses that I was in before Grow Motley, I was in financial planning. I built productized service businesses. I built them over and over again and sold them. Did it quite well. And I'm very familiar with the pain points for companies that are – 5, 10, 20, even 50 people or whatever. There's just a lot of challenges. And to your point, at that stage, they usually have not developed a very good recruitment process. Mm. A lot of the time, quite frankly, they're hiring people who pop up out of convenience. The friend of the friend, the cousin, the whatever, who's going to do some social media management and, and also do the bookkeeping. Great. So your friend's cousin's now responsible for bringing in your clients and ensuring you have really good financials. Like, I don't know, maybe they're really good at both those things. But like Probably also not. what if what if you just looked <laughs> in the world for the best person to be your yeah. financial controller yeah. and the best person to do your marketing or, or whatever it might be. So, yeah. so we built um, – a whole recruitment, best practice recruitment pipeline, which starts with candidates applying for roles. They need to answer pre-screen questions, written pre-screen questions, even to apply. So automatically that stops you putting a job up and getting a thousand applicants that are not the right fit. Absolutely. And based on their written responses, you also have a bit of a sense for how excited they actually are about the role. And yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of, we, we hire all of our own talent on Gromotely and I've helped a bunch of companies do it as well. And As does Joe, right? Your yeah, husband, he's, yeah. he's hired his entire team yeah. through Gromotely. Including his um, operations manager who's yep. our business partner. So yep. yeah, C- C- COO type person. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, and so like looking through all these candidates and seeing whether they've written one word answers or mm. one sentence or they've written five sentences and you can just feel their enthusiasm. It's this mm. automatic like start in the process that really get, gets you to see like, oh, what have we got here? What are we looking at? Mm. And then the next stage in the process is a video Q&A. So you would drag them to the next step and they'll get an email to say, do a video Q&A. So then you're getting a sense they record these answers, two yeah. minutes each it's pretty short. You can up speed if you need to, but you're getting a feel for them, both written and now video before you go and invest an hour of time or 20 minutes or whatever it might be for you in an online interview. But that's the third step. And we have I reference love, checks and things as well. But I love that step. That's, oh, that's it is my favorite. Changer. Yeah. <laughs> it really beautiful. is. Yeah. It really is a game changer. Um, and getting the sense of people, their written style, their video Q&A, mm. and then jumping on and you feel your own chemistry with them. Mm. It's a really beautiful process to kind of understand the whole person. Um, and, you know, some people are nervous on their video and, mm. like, that's okay as well. Mm. Like, staying open-minded but because you've got these different channels of getting to experience them and know them, you're yeah. starting to piece together who this whole person is on top of the resume or their pro their remotely profile, which is essentially the resume. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really cool and mm. it works well. I hired my assistant in eight days. I put the role up. I got a hundred and something applicants, shortlisted them down to seven, did seven interviews back to back in a two hour slot. Wow. I'm also very intuitive in my hiring, I will say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, and then I made her the offer. After the it was a total of eight days. So, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing talking to you and Joe and others who, who have literally built their entire teams through this platform. Because as you as you mentioned in passing a little bit earlier, is so many people are looking to work remote these days. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I expand everything I'm doing over into the USA, it, it, it this platform has even been a little bit of a catalyst for me to think: Do I if and when we build a team here? Do I want a team in an office or do I want, you know, yeah. like Joe, I was talking to Joe, he had, is it his CMO in South Africa? Yeah, right. she is brilliant. Yeah, like, she's brilliant. Oh my God, I was right. looking at the marketing plans and stuff <laughs> she was putting together for her company. I'm like, yeah, we found you a real good CMO. Right. <laughs> I and mean, so, she's incredible. And so it's this distillation of really good talent from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so if you're hiring in Austin, you're not limited to the Austin talent pool. Yep. You can be hiring in Austin all around the globe. And you're not then tied to Austin, which right. is something that I felt. I, I turned my company's remote in 2014 because I love to travel. I mean, obviously yeah. I moved over here. I've lived in, I don't know, five different countries I love to travel and yeah. I was just finding I'm not traveling as much. I'm not living this life where I get to go live in other places because I'm tied to my office in Melbourne right. and I feel like I've got to be there before, you know, I was setting the worst kinds of examples, but at the time I thought they were the best, like getting right. in really early and working really late so my team know how dedicated I am and right. modeling to them how dedicated they need to be, which yeah. is it dedicated or just spending a lot of time in, in, in a room? <laughs> 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 there's not a necessary correlation. I mean, there's a lot of unpacking of, <laughs> and unwinding of stories when we when we come out of the office. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 amazing the the global talent pool uh, that you can get access to and then be remote yourself mm -hmm. as an owner, CEO, manager. Uh, yeah, it, I I really do believe this platform will be fundamental in 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 helping shape that that way yeah. across the globe. It's super totally. Exciting. I was thinking on the way over here of like. The, we need to shift the argument from like, should people be going back to the office or not to like, how about we demand more from the spaces we live in, the cities, the mm. towns? Like, why are we so desperate to get back to an office? Why not create more livable cities where we all get mm. to hang out and live and work together? Like the mm. argument that because you need your social circle in your grey air-conditioned office building where you have to sit for eight hours a day and you're allowed to leave for 30 minutes at lunch. But, you know, people can't survive without that, that we've got social social uh, issues because people are alone. It's like you're not alone because you're working remotely and how about we get back to our communities and mm. now I can sit down – like we're moving to, we bought land, 70 acres outside of Austin where I get to go and live with my immediate community and build a billion dollar company. Like, yeah. yes. Do both. <laughs> yes to that. <laughs> That's a full body fuck yes. Yeah. <laughs> we love a full body yes. That's good. That's good. And so, so I said I was going to come back to um, the, the practices that you still do today 
around self-care, self-nourishment, keeping yourself centered. Mm -hmm. What what are some of the things that you still do these days? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like the more I've been on this journey, the more integrated everything becomes Mm. in my life. So whereas kind of pre that breakdown, I was doing, I had the morning ritual, like I had all the things that I did every morning, Mm. wake up drink my lemon salt water, do my movement, meditate. Like it was like this list of things that I had to do. Um, and I think where I've found myself at this point, it's it's so integrated. I usually, I'll take little meditation breaks all throughout the day, just moments to myself where I sit and ground and, and come in and I work at home. So I'll go out into my garden or mm. wherever I am and plant my feet on the ground um, I'll journal when I'm trying to nut through something. Do I force myself to journal every single morning like I used to? No. Um, that can be valuable and sometimes I go through periods of doing that and and right now, not so much. I kind yeah. of do it when I'm really nutting over something. Mm. Um, I still do medicine work when I'm called. Yeah. I, it, it shifts and evolves um, over time. I eat well and I would say just better and better. Like as I get a deeper soul connection with what my body needs and doesn't need it becomes more and more intuitive once again it's more just integrated into life though than it is strict if that makes sense that makes all the sense yeah because i think what people can tend to do and we we all we've all done it we all do it is i'm going to do my practices in the morning and then i'm going to go and be a charged angry frustrated <laughs> driven yeah. conqueror mm-hmm. and then i'll meditate for 20 minutes in the afternoon yeah. you know and so the, the, it's 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 disjointed and i think eckhart Tolle talks about this he talks about what's more effective is bring consciousness into every everything moment. Mm-hmm. yeah which is exactly what you do and is exactly what you're talking about yeah and i mean even like the people that i spend my time with like we drop right into deep conversations so we always joke that like our life is like on a retreat. Like yeah. what I experienced on that first ayahuasca retreat, I now live that. Like I, wow. you know, my girlfriend lives in the same street as me. She'll come over and like next thing you know, we're crying in the back garden and then we're <laughs> yeah. dancing naked under the stars yes. and like, and that's just Wednesday <laughs> afternoon. Like, <laughs> but that's life. And, and yes, I've created that life, life for myself yeah. where I now – get to like move and process through things as they're happening and really experience everything that this life is versus like what you said where I, okay, I go once a year on this retreat and the rest of the Mm. time I just let it get all chaotic and Mm. messed up. And Mm. then I go and I feel like that, that was the, the approach that we were all probably conditioned into a little bit as well, right. like the hustle and the grind and the discipline and 100%. and then everything had so much discipline and structure around it. But if we have a more, I mean, we could get into the whole like integration of the masculine, and the feminine within all of us. But I think when we, when we do integrate it a bit more, it, it becomes um, a lot less discipline oriented and more yeah. intuitive. And, but we have those tools. We know how to, yeah, channel and harness what we need to if we do need a little discipline but it doesn't have to be so strict all yeah the time. more integrated sarah hawley thank you so much i'm really glad we got to dancing naked under the moonlight <laughs> uh, if, if you didn't bring it up i was gonna <laughs> i do love to be naked <laughs> I told Joe we're going to Hippie Hollow and he's like, you Australians, you just love getting naked. <laughs> so in the water over there. <laughs> I love it. So if you're in Austin, we'll meet you at Hippie Hollow. <laughs> so for those that have loved this conversation and want to continue following you, how, how do they do that? Yeah, get me on LinkedIn yeah. um, and just reach out Grimotely. Yeah, Sarah at Grimotely.com. But, but join us. Come sign up for the platform. We would love to welcome you. Absolutely. And do, whether you're a company, a founder or a <laughs> professional, uh, you know, who, who wants to be a candidate in the global marketplace, Grimotely is definitely the place to be. So uh, I want to honor all of the work that you have done where I started today. Uh Everything you've been through, everything you've processed and moved through and the person that you've become is absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm in deep reverence of you every Thank day. Thank you, brother. Uh, and it's an it's a honour and a privilege to call you a friend. So thank you for coming in. Well, thank you. And right back at you, I'm 
I'm so honoured that our journey is is going on this path and I see you, I see you showing up as well and mm. it's beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you do three quick things to ensure you continue on this journey of growing into the very best version of yourself. Number one, hit the subscribe button and make sure you've got notifications turned on. Number two, check out more videos up here that you can watch right now. And number three, stay connected. Follow me over on Instagram at Jack Delosa or head to the-entourage.com in order to join a movement of 550,000 seven and eight figure business owners. I look forward to seeing you there.